Hi everyone, sorry we're a little late, maybe fashionably late, um, but thanks for hanging in there, especially today. Uh, really appreciate you joining us. Looks like we've got a full uh, house here, 112 people that were in the waiting room. I really appreciate it because I know it's uh, St. Patrick's Day and you probably could be enjoying a beverage somewhere else, but you've chosen to spend the evening with us. So thank you for that. Um, Tech Tactics Live episode 24. I know it's been a few weeks and I apologize I wasn't here last week or we weren't here last week, but hopefully you enjoyed what we did deliver to you last week. And that was the um, introduction of the GT3 Cup with uh, Mike Levitis and the folks over at TPC Racing. If you haven't checked that out, please do. Um, I think that's probably over 24, 25,000 views and it's, it's a really, really neat video if you haven't seen it. Oh, speaking of, uh, wanted to give a shout out to our new Tech Tactics Live sponsor. We're able to keep the lights on and continue to do the show. And it thanks to the folks at Pirelli. So please, um, you know, if you see folks uh, from Pirelli at, at events, at PCA events and around, just thank them for their support of Tech Tactics Live because without them, I'm not so sure how much longer this would go. So we, we will continue for at least 2021 if uh, that's okay with you all. Tonight, we're talking about the 2005-2008 Boxster Caymans, known as the 987.1 cars. Be sure to put your name and where you're from in the live chat section for prizes. We've got two prizes tonight. Maybe uh, Robert can pull them up. We have a Nürburgring Rally Road print canvas that'll look nice in uh, your living room or possibly in, in your garage. And we also have a Nürburgring t-shirt for, for someone tonight. Um, please be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And uh, we will make sure that uh, we keep the show rolling. Let's see, I want to introduce Nathan Murs, PCA Tech Committee member, owner of Columbia Valley Luxury Cars. First person to be on Tech Tactics Live three times. Three times, we seem to like you. So thanks. You know, well, I appreciate that, Vu. Uh, you know, at first I got I got to start the evening off because I'm I'm repping my Gonzaga gear. So I just want to give a preemptive shout out to the soon to be NCAA basketball oh. championships, which of course start on Saturday, and I got my team on. So I just got to start with that. You know, <laughs> no basketball shot, comments that. on the live chat because I know that can just derail the, the uh, whole it evening. Is, it is the start of March Madness, <laughs> so uh, you know we got we got to represent here. So well, good good luck to your team. Um, Let's go over the agenda. We've, we've got an hour. We will go over uh, past nine o'clock a bit since we did get started late. So if we can see the agenda, please. We're gonna first start with the overview of the 987. We're gonna talk about the current market. We're going to talk a little bit about S, non-S, tip, tronic versus manual. We're going to shop for a 987.1. We actually have a car here, Damon Lowney, who uh, most of you know that you've been watching the show. He brought his 2007 here, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that car as though we're purchasing it. We're going to pull the engine cover for those of you that have never seen the inside uh, or underneath the uh, engine covers on uh, a Cayman slash Boxster. We'll do that. We'll talk about when you might want to walk away from the car that you're considering because you know when we first go out hunting for a Porsche we tend to fall in love very quickly so we'll need to know when to walk away and then we'll throw up some references we're certainly not going to be able to cover every aspect of what you need to know about a 987.1 uh, car so we'll throw up some references for you um, so Nathan let's just get right into it the 987.1 why should people be looking at this era car well, I'm actually, you know, we were kind of bantering back and forth and we were saying, well, you know, which which model Porsche should we talk about? And I have a particular affinity for the mid-engine, be it the 986, 987, or 981, or now 718 chassis cars. Uh, I'm an avowed rear engine guy, so don't get me wrong, but I, I've long held that the mid-engine cars, you know, if Porsche introduced that car first, we very well may not have a Carrera, right? Uh, we may not have a 911. Uh, it's a fabulous car. Um, and I think right now, one of the reasons I think it's interesting, as prices have gone up across the board for all sorts of Porsches, 
we leave a lot of potential enthusiasts behind because, you know, if you have, you know, 15, 20, 25 thousand dollars to spend on realistically what's an extravagance, right? It's a toy car or something fun. What can you buy in the Porsche world? Well, I think this makes a really compelling argument of, of a good place to start. And the best part of this, it's not, it's even a good place to end. Like if you could only have one Porsche in your world, I, I can almost not say anything bad about these cars, um, whether it be the open top variant in the Boxster or the more fixed roof in the Cayman. So to me, it's a, it's a great uh, entree into the Porsche. It's a great only Porsche. Uh, there's things to know about them. So they're kind of fun to talk about. And right now, they're not getting um, an inordinate amount of love. They've never been unliked, uh, but they're not one of the red-hot models in the market. So there's still some reasonable buys out there. So that makes it a fun topic. Yeah, and I think recently, uh, over the past year or so, we've really had more of the conversation about the 986 and the 996s and sort of the pluses and minuses with them. So these weren't part of that conversation, and there's things about those cars that we've talked and and I'm sh you know we could probably do a whole nother segment on the values of those cars and how nice examples are commanding a premium now. And so I, I think once you've talked about that era enough, like then let's talk about the next one, and this is the next one. Absolutely. So where do we want to kick it off, Vu? So let's talk about how much these things run for. I've seen them as low as 12, 13 grand, all the way to you know mid 20s, high 20s, low 30s, depending on miles and example. And that's a pretty wide range for one particular model. Um, what have you seen in the market? Well, it's an interesting thing. This is a, sort of a a weird moment in, in Porsche history, and I'm going to call this out, and a lot of us nerds will know this, but this is the only model where Porsche sold the open top version for less money than the closed top version, which is sort of interesting, right? So when they were new, the Boxster was less money than the Cayman was. And interestingly enough, in, in the Porsche market, excluding the 356, Closed cars generally sell for more than the open cars, right? Which is sort of this weird change from what they cost new. But in the Boxster Cayman world, uh, even though the Boxster was less expensive, it's still less expensive used than the Caymans. The Caymans hold their value a little bit better than the Boxster. So at the very bottom of the pricing spectrum uh, for 987s would typically be a 2005 base Boxster, typically with a Tiptronic with higher miles. And you might find one of those in the, Maybe as low as 10, that might be the very bottom. I would probably be a little bit nervous about one priced at 10. Um, but I would argue probably 15 could get you in a car that um, shouldn't have any major foibles or be anything that's a major concern. So that represents sort of the bottom of the market. Um, the Caymans really haven't dipped much below 20. Um, every so often you'll see one drop into the high teens, um, but it seems to be kind of unusual. And then you know, the S models tend to bring a fairly good premium used. Um, so about the bottom of the market, an early S Boxster uh, 16, 17 sort of seems to be about the bottom. Um, and then the, the Cayman S's really haven't dipped below about 22. So that represents sort of the bottom. If we flip on the other side and we say, okay, top of market, top of market would be generally two cars. It would either be a 2008 Boxster RS60. Uh, I think you showed a picture of one a little bit earlier. Those are the ones that were finished in GT Silver, uh, predominantly with the red interior, although you could get them alternate with the gray interior if you wanted so. Uh, those cars um, right now are bringing mid-30s. Some of them are touching 40 if they're, they're really low miles. And then the other car that, that draws some interest are they issued a bunch of interesting final 2008 models, the Design Edition 1 cars. I think you showed one of those as well as they issued some in the um, RS orange, as well as the green. And those cars sell like hotcakes, because of course they're the color that people are very Yeah, let me interrupt so, you. I think, Robert, we have the, a folder of the special edition cars that Nathan was talking about, so we can, we can spin, show those to folks. Yeah, so this is a design edition one car, design edition two, I take that back. The design edition one cars were all black, uh, the Design Edition 2 cars are white, so there we go. 
Um, there's actually been quite a few of these uh, black design edition cars on Bring a Trailer as of late. I think there's one on there now, and there's also one of these RS60 um, cars, which is a pretty compelling package. What Porsche will generally do is they know us Porsche nerds, we study all the specifications and we read our pano and we know, hey, Porsche's coming out with a new model next year. Maybe I'll wait. And so what they what they like to put together, I call them the kitchen sink model, Absolutely. which means they, they put a package together where they put everything but the kitchen sink. They usually have a couple unique items you can't get otherwise. They package into a neat package and it generally sells for a discount versus if you bought each of those options separately. So God bless Porsche. Hopefully they're not listening, but they sure know how to get extra money on options. So this is one of the rare times you get to actually get more options for less money. It almost never happens. So these are generally pretty cool cars. Now, do they command a premium, like a same year Cayman Boxster, if it's a special edition? What kind of premium would you be looking towards? You know, each each derivation is a little bit different. And of course, when people own one, they'll argue that it, it's, it's deserving of some massive premium. Um, so, for example, if we, if we deal with the Boxster RS60s, those have a pretty big premium because the package is so compelling. Um, they have the 19-inch wheels. They have sport exhaust. They actually got a whopping eight more horsepower, which is just a software reflash. They have the all-red taillights. They have a full leather uh, Carrera red interior. Um, they come with PASM. So they have a pretty compelling package that people just really respond to. So that car sells for a pretty big premium over a regular 2008 Boxster S. You know, I would generally say the premium might be upwards of, say, 30 percent for one of those. Now, if we flip over to the Cayman, the Design Edition 1 cars, I don't think bring as much of a premium because they're not as distinct. They get some some stripes. They get the turbo wheels. um, They get an Alicantara steering wheel and shift knob. They do get the extra eight horsepower, I believe. Um, but because they're black and the colorway isn't all that unique, I haven't found them to bring the same premium as like the RS60 brings. Um, I think the Design Edition 2 car brings slightly more than a Design Edition 1. Um, so I think that's one note. And then the other one is the, um, and the name is escaping me, but they made a package um of either orange or green. I don't I think we had one maybe that was up there. Well, okay, yeah. one of these. Now these are interesting because you could get this in, in a base or the S. And the big premium comes with the color. So it's interesting, even a base in the orange will sell typically for more than an S in the orange or in, in a regular color, mm. just because people are going to pay a premium for that color. Um, and again, it's much like the RS60, it's a very distinct grouping of options in colorway that you couldn't get on another car or you couldn't get it outside of paint to sample. So uh, very high demand for this or the green, whether it be in the Boxster or the Cayman configuration. Nathan, let, let me ask you, when I was searching for photos of 05 to uh, 08 cars, uh, much like the 07 that's here, the fog lights are round in, in the front bumper. But then when when did it move to the the flat light like you saw on that orange car? Because um, I know the Gen the 987.2 cars don't have the round fog lights anymore. So was was the deletion of the round fog lights started with the special editions, or when when did that change? No, the round headlight is a Cayman styling element, and the the, the fog light element you see there is the Boxster. So if you'll get any Boxster; it's going to have that oh, style okay. fog light. Okay. And the Caymans will have the round, which they had through the end of the 987.1. Okay. And dot so, two, they, they changed those. Gotcha. Gotcha. Huh. Very cool. Um, so when we talk about 986 and 996s, you always have the subject of IMS, right? The intermediate shaft bearing in that car. And with the 05, 06, 07, 08 Boxster Cayman, there is still an IMS bearing in that car, but tell us the difference when it's in this car. Yeah. So uh, first caveat would be anytime you're considering a Porsche um, and God bless Porsche, I eat, breathe and sleep Porsche. If I'm not thinking Gonzaga basketball again, I'm thinking Porsche. Uh, Every iteration has known potential issues, right? 
And so sometimes, particularly more entry-level buyers will say to me, well, I'm so worried about this failing or that failing or this being a potential. And I always throw it out there. I say, if you want a car that has no risk of failure, minimal risk of failure, that's why you buy a Toyota, right? God bless it. There's a purpose for the Toyota in the world. Uh, but Porsche, everyone has known ones and you just need to go in with your eyes open and say, okay, what are the potential issues? How do I you know, best become comfortable with what they are? How do I identify them up front to limit my risk? But understand that there's no way to completely absolve any risk in, in really any of these cars. Sure. Okay. Um, so, but they but they do break out a little bit because the 2005 through maybe halfway through production year 2005 really share uh, the same bearing design as the M96, um, 986, and 996 cars. So they have the highest rate of failure would be the 05. Um, and you can look online, there's sort of a known serial number at which the switch happens, but it's not definitive. So do not, you know, stake your life on it. The only way to know is actually pull the tranny and actually look at what bearing you have. But if you have an early 05, it's a safe bet that you have an older style bearing. The good news with those cars is then you can do a proactive replacement of some kind, right? Um, and I won't go into that because, of course, everyone has their favorite opinion. I have my own. Uh, but you can make a proactive replacement. With the 05 and a half through 08 cars, they have the latest generation of bearing that Porsche put out, uh, which the official Porsche line is that they don't fail. Um, I would say that's probably a, a little bit optimistic, but the failure rate is very low. To me, it, it falls into a realm of a tolerable risk. With that said, it's not zero. So if you if you say to yourself, I absolutely cannot stomach any possibility that I have an IMS failure, you just simply can't buy one of these cars. There's, there's no one who can tell you that you absolutely could not have a failure. Um, but the failure rate is very small on these cars. Um, but there is no way to do a proactive replacement. Um, I take that back. There is a couple of people that say they can do a proactive replacement. I'm not comfortable with how they're doing that. Mm -hmm. So the general consensus is there's no way to do a proactive replacement because the bearing is physically too large to be extracted from the case. So of so course the, you'd have to. So the only way is to split the case. If yeah, you and then if you're going to do that, well, at that point, why would you have? <laughs> I mean, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so that's you know something worth talking about. Um, so one of the things it does is it puts a lot of pressure on the 987.2 market because a lot of people say, oh. 987.2's got what they call the 9A1 series of motors, which no longer use that same architecture. And so the, they can't have an IMS failure. So a lot of people say, well, then I'll just skip over the 987.1. I'll get a .2. There's two problems with that. The 987.2 is a great car, uh, but production was very low due to the economy during that period of time. Um, and we also have very, very, very high demand because a lot of people have this IMS concern. So Basic economics says low production, high demand. What's that mean? High price. Yeah. So to me, the value, the 97.2 is a great car. Is it worth the substantial increase in cost for that one issue in my book? No. Um, would I be upset that someone wants a 97.2? Absolutely not. It's a great car. Um, and if you're willing to spend that. Uh, but I, I personally would not overlook a 97.1. And in fact, one of the bummers tonight is that I'm, sitting inside, but I wanted to be out in the garage because I have a very special 987 of mine in the garage and I wanted to show it off because uh, I believe in the cars, but internet connection is not good in the garage. So we get the kitchen. No. So that, you know, that's, that's absolutely it is, you know, these cars are deserving to, to have the love that it's, it's finally getting. And I, I think people will start realizing at what a deal they are and you'll start seeing these 987.1 cars starting to go up in price because they, they're just a tremendous package. Um, speaking of packages, what would, what would you say comparing S versus non-S and maybe Tiptronic versus manual? Yeah, so one of the other things that we, we know in the Porsche world is that, uh, I'm not sure why this is, but uh, maybe we all have ego problems, but everybody always thinks no matter what, they have to have an S. It's like a default. 
Like they won't even talk about it. They just go, well, I have to have an S. And so I always challenge people. I said, well, why do you have to have an S? And it's maybe our human nature. We think, well, if there's something that has more power, by default, it has to be better. Well, if we use that logic, well, then we would just buy American muscle cars. They have more horsepower. Uh, but of course, we're about balance and a whole total package with Porsche, right? And so I always tell people, do not dismiss the base model of really any Porsche. Um, there are several uh, Porsches that I actually personally prefer the base model uh, versus the S or the 4S or whatever derivation there might be. So what I would say is look at both, You know, see how you want to use the car, which car you emotionally respond to. And then most importantly, now that these are getting to be 15 years old cars, buy the absolute best example you can find, focusing maybe less on its original specification and more on the quality of that exact car. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is I'd rather have an absolutely unbelievably well-maintained, pristine, nicely optioned PCA member-owned 07 base Cayman than a seven-owner bought off Highway 99 at Moe's used car lot 06 came in S, right? No offense, Mo. <laughs> yeah, I like Mo. He's a good guy. I mean, you know, I can get my Hyundai Elantra from him, but I don't really want to get my Cayman from him. So, all right. So let's go shopping for a car. We've got Damon's uh, 987 here. I'm going to try, I'm not going to be able to monitor my phone. So if you guys are talking to me through my phone, I'm going to miss it because I'm going to try to walk around while being tethered to the microphone here so let's see if this works all right so you're shopping for a 987 you come across a car that looks like this one here um, so I'm gonna bring my you know my trusted second set of eyes Nathan here uh, with me when I go look at this car and we're just gonna start from front to back and Nathan if you can just help me kind of you know pick pick things or just kind of say, take a look at certain things that might be common issues with a car of this era. Um, right up front, I'm just gonna just, just jump right into it. Uh, I'm, looking, I'm looking up front here and seeing how much debris and possible damage, what kind of mileage, what kind of um, uh, salt and pepper from road rash and such gives you an indication of how much a car has been used. If it's got like 80,000 miles in a perfect front bumper, probably has been repainted or something, right? Or some reason. Um, this car here, uh, Damon has not washed and that's not for the show. That's just how he keeps it. <laughs> I'm throwing Damon under the bus. Um, these cars also, much like um, 996s and 997s and such, they have these plastic headlights here. So oftentimes if a car has lived outside all of its life, these can yellow and you can bring them back by polishing them and such, but just know that if these are bad or cloudy and if you want them perfect, they're not cheap, right? So um, his hood struts work. I'm looking underneath here to see if there's any kind of bends or if this was like a, um, a, a replacement hood. Again, if I saw that the front bumper was, was super clean, I'd say, why is there paint work or what happened there? So I'm looking there, I keep walking. Uh, these cars also have these plastic cowls up front here that fade, and Damon, yours is faded, so we might want to change that out. Or Shame on you, Damon. <laughs> there, there's stuff that you can put on it, but but these things are pretty inexpensive. I think they're like 100 bucks, and that's the whole piece. And we, we have a video um, how to replace these uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, speaking of which, while I'm walking around, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, please, because that helps out the channel. I'm looking at the front here, at the wheels and tires. Uh, again, I don't know how well this person maintains their car because their wheels are incredibly dirty. <laughs> <laughs> hey, exactly. It's good. Uh, it does need brakes, actually, though. Uh, brakes look like they're at half-life. Any any particular issues with this model car uh, up front here? Uh, you know, in terms of a couple things that I, because that I, we're just looking at that front wheel, uh, you know, this era of Porsche, and Porsches in general actually tend to not be hard on brakes on street cars. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to look at the rotors and make sure they're not, you know, cracking. They're not, there's not a big lip on them. Uh, one of the things that people love to do is they love to take their car to the little quickie detailer who 
doesn't want to actually work very hard, so we use a lot of wheel acid. So you'll see those cars where the brake caliper, particularly on the red caliper cars, all the paint is turned pink. Um, the lug nuts are rusty. The rotor hats are rusty. And that's generally from someone cleaning it with an aggressive wheel acid, um, which, again, if you love those little, you know, drive your car through and they clean it for 15 bucks and you wonder how they get their, your wheels so clean when it takes you so long, uh, usually better living through chemistry, but that chemistry is going to work against you long term. So mm. uh, I'm looking at that. Um, I always want to look at tires. So, you know, we're, we've only been beating up on Ford Damon, but we got to give him kudos. Look, he's got the right rubber on the car. He's got Michelin's, although we are sponsored by Pirelli. So Pirelli's would be great as well. Those are both an N spec Porsche tire. Um, I'm going to look at the date code. You want to show people how we find a date code, Boo? That's always a good thing 22. to check. Uh, 22nd week of 2020. Okay, so right? I want to call this out because this is something I see all the time. So everyone, go out to your garage when you're bored tonight. Every tire on the sidewall, this is federally mandated, we'll start with a DOT. You can see that those last four digits are going to indicate the week and the year of the manufacturer. So 22nd week of 20. So these tires are basically brand new. They were made looks maybe May of 2020. Um it depends on how you're going to use the car, but as a general rule, I do not want to run a tire more than about seven or eight years. And because Porsches tend to be, you know, third cars or get limited usage, oftentimes I'll go look at cars and people say, oh, the tires are great. And I, and I look at it and I look at the date code there from 2004, um, particularly front tires, because... I will say the uh, tires on this car when I bought it was, were about seven, eight years old, which is why I replaced them. them. Yeah, wow. see, good man. So... Um, Check your date codes. Again, particularly the front uh, will tend to be older because these tend to wear tires in a ratio of about two to one. So oftentimes people will put a new set of rears. You'll find the rears have a date code of 2012 and the fronts have a 2004 date code on them. So pay particular attention to that. Even a lot of PPIs, I find they'll measure tread depth and they don't pay attention to age. Um, and so tires will fail due to age. Not to mention they just get greasy and they're not a lot of fun to drive on. So uh, fresh rubber is always a key thing. What about the S brakes versus the non S brakes? Is there a big difference between caliper and rotor sizes? Uh, they are different. So the S's do get bigger brakes. Although the funny thing is, Porsches are almost never under braked. I can't think of a single modern Porsche that's under braked. I mean, I know Damon autocrosses this car, so he might be able to speak to this, but I've gone out in these base cars and, um, absolutely just flogged them in fact I, we autocrossed that rental 718 we had at per, uh, the last parade and even on a hot florida day and running the majibus out of that car you can't get them to fade um you know if i was going to maybe do you know back to back 20 minute track sessions yeah i probably might invest in some track pads and stuff but um don't buy an s simply because um you think you need more brake um i mean the red caliper certainly are sexy but uh, a base car has more than enough brake on it Oh, I will say for an autocross that, uh, that uh, these, these brakes are just fine, fine as well as the back road. road. Um, um, I have not driven it on track yet, yet and will probably, probably invest in new discs and new pads before I do that. All right, so let's take a look at the interior of this car. Um, you had mentioned when we spoke earlier, Nathan, about headliners in these cars. What are your experience yep. with them? Um, Caymans in particular that come, and it seems anecdotally cars from hot climates, um, they just start to droop. So if you look in the back corners, if it just sort of looks like it's losing its mojo, it's not nice and crisp up in the corners, uh, and that's usually where it starts. Uh, sometimes you'll find it under the visors, you know, flip the visors forward and you'll see they're kind of like the, the fabrics peeling away from the backing. Um, I mean, the good news is they're not incredibly hard to do on the Cayman because you can get the headliner out the rear hatch. So um, having a rear hatch is a beautiful thing. Uh, gotcha. Much harder to do in a 911. <laughs> this car actually had its headliner replaced by the uh, previous, uh, previous owner. owner. Oh, it did. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh, that's why it's in good shape. Now, I noticed your center stack, uh, Damon, the common problem where the temperature and the fan controls, they wear out. Like, I guess the, the coating... But I believe you can get replacement pieces and swap those out, right? Yeah. So this is a really common problem, and it uh, we can blame ourselves. And why do I say that? Well, the reason they have this rubberized coating is we a lot of us complained on the 986 that we felt that the buttons looked cheap. They were kind of a smooth plastic. 
And so what Porsche did is they coated these in a soft touch rubberized plastic. It felt nice to the touch. It cut down the sheen and it looked more expensive. Well, the problem is over time that rubberized coating, particularly again, when they get hot or you get sunscreen on your hands, lotion, uh, that starts breaking down. And this is epidemic across German cars. You'll find this on Volkswagen, Audi and BMW, things like that. Um, but it's kind of unsightly. Uh, you'll get that same uh, effect on the radio knobs. They'll get sticky. Um, so like you can see Damon's they got some sticky knobs. Sorry, Damon, we're yeah, picking on you. Happen. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things like you can bears. do. <laughs> uh, this is the unofficial answer, um, but this is my trick. I'll share it with you guys. Um, pull the radio knobs off. Um, put on some gloves because this is caustic stuff, but worth a brake cleaner uh, on those knobs. Mm -hmm. uh, let them soak and scrub them down with a microfiber towel. Do that a couple times and they'll come out like new. So, so it, it removes back all on. of the rubber, rubber coating? Uh, it, it'll just do the knobs. If you do the same trick on the, I tried it once on the HVAC on one that was already that bad and it, it did not go well, uh, <laughs> but the okay. radio knobs. I'm glad, uh, glad we mentioned that before everybody messed up their interiors. <laughs> uh, yeah. So worth break clean. I'm telling you, that stuff is miraculous. Um, again, wear gloves. It's pretty caustic stuff in terms of the, the HVAC. There's a, a couple people out there that, uh, you can either send the whole unit to them and they'll replace it for you. Or if you're a little bit more of a DIYer, they'll send you just the new um, switch gear and you can pull the unit apart, reassemble it. And it's a pretty straightforward fix and it looks a thousand times better. And it's something you touch all the time when you're in the car, you're adjusting fan speed or temperature and it just, it, it feels bad. And so to have nice new switches makes a big difference. Yeah. So while we're still looking at the interior of this car, obviously, uh, I see a non-stock uh, sort of race style seat and uh, some other modifications to this interior. So as a shopper, I'm going to go, this person probably pushes this car more than the average owner. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something I think you need to make note of as you know, we're not going to go underneath of this car, but, um, you know, as you take a closer look, if you really like the car, just know that because it's been driven harder, you're probably going to be taking a closer look at maybe suspension components. And, and later on, we'll take a peek underneath of, uh, these engine panels here. What, what kudos do you... to Damon for using the car. That's all I got to say. I, I, yeah. I tend to be a uh, wipe down with a diaper kind of guy. So, so Nathan, do you, um, how, how do you treat cars that seem to be driven, you know, say competitively versus cars that are just in garages and taken out on uh, to cars and coffee? Well, you know, I, I always try to look at it holistically. First off, I never absolutely dismiss a car. You know, some people, I mean, I, I kind of laugh. I mean, because I do this for a living, I'll, I'll have a car, I'll take a early 911 or something and Something as innocuous as it has a front strut, strut tie bar, I'll get buyers, I'll say, well, I'm not buying that car because it's been raced. And I always think, well, probably not. They probably just thought it was a cool accessory. Um, but so I don't ever rule a car out simply because it's been used as Porsche really wanted you to use the car. I With agree. that said, I do understand that if you're going to use the car harder, well, then I want to see commiserate backup with documentation of additional service right yep. so in this case you're buying the owner if you know nothing else you want to buy the owner and that's the beauty of something like the porsche club when you get to meet and talk and and have a cup of coffee and talk about the core and talk about how they've used it and how they've maintained it that's that's worth so much more than buying one blind or you don't get the opportunity to see who had it um and so one of the things i always look for is there's always evidence that a car has spent time um, at the track or at autocross or some kind of definite tells, you know, the classic one is the, the cone marks. If you've ever done autocross, you know what cone marks look like. They're usually on the rockers. You also find lots of bits of rubber kind of underneath the car and weird places where you think, how the heck did they get that much rubber underneath the car? Yep. Um, and then there's generally some, some wear on brakes and things that you just don't see. Uh, my favorite one is a lot of times, you know, guys that go do autocross change their brake pads all the time. So they disconnect the um, brake pad wear sensors and those are wire tied up. That's always mm -hmm. a dead giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it doesn't mean I'll roll the car out. It just means I'm going to look at it a little more closely. Um, so 
Well, let's let's take a little bit closer. Um, we've taken off what uh, five or so of these Torx head screws. And for those of you that have never seen the the top of the case here on a Cayman, there's a sound like a sound barrier pad that just pops off. Um, and then you remove the Torx head screws for service. And I think there's even an aftermarket company that makes like a see-through version of this. So if you like looking at your engine all the time, you can probably get one of those. But here we go, a non-detailed engine. <laughs> not, yeah. that I, not that I expected that it would be detailed, but what would we be looking in here, Nathan? Well, first and foremost, probably if anyone's on this, I would venture to say 90% of mid-engine Porsche owners have never seen their engine. No. Uh, they think it's like some big mystery. So you saw how easily that was taken off. I would encourage you just, even if you don't really know what you're looking at, uh, one of the reasons I like to do even minor service on my own cars is just taking the time to become familiar and, and look at what's normal. So, you know, Boo, again, you keep beating up on my man, Damon, but I appreciate the honesty in the engine bay because, you know, it's not been freshly cleaned. So I can tell, okay, what am I looking for? So these things are not prone um, to leaks like, you know, older Porsches are. But again, if I'm not a mechanic, what I'm looking for is what's out of place? Mm -hmm. you know, is there something in here that stands out? So, you know, for example, I see a layer of dust and I saw and I see one area is super clean. And then yeah. I'm going to ask the owner, hey, it looks like you maybe had some work done. Oh, yeah, I ended up having to replace this or I ended up having to replace that. You know, I'm looking for things that don't look OE. You know, why are there missing fasteners? You know, just things that catch my eye. Because, again, mm -hmm. I always recommend to someone a PPI. Your job when you're looking at a car is grab the obvious stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, I always hate when a car comes in for a PPI and there's something that's really obvious that I think, Man, I feel bad charging someone to look at this car when there's something they should have seen from 10 feet away. Does that make sense? So you're just looking for anything that looks out of place, any any leaking fluids, anything that's recently clean, anything that doesn't look Porsche factory. It doesn't necessarily make it bad, but it just means you got to ask the question, right? All right. I think we have some winners, but I think the subtitles uh... – we don't have them assigned to the correct prizes, I don't think. Robert, are, is it Joe John and Paul Steves that are our winners? I can't hear you, but we'll, we'll post the winners here shortly. Um, so let's continue to move on and look at the front side of the engine. So I'm gonna climb in. Oh, hey, real, real quick, Vubi, I, I yep. was one thing I always wanna tell you to do, if the car is cold, let's just look at fluids. Yep. Um, so that was a really simple. I want to look at coolant and make sure when I look at coolant, all I got is coolant, right? So I don't want to see an intermix. So if I see anything that looks oily or non-coolant-like, again, I don't have to be a mechanic. Uh, those are two two fluids that should never mix with each other. So I want to look at that. Um, I'm generally going to try to like look at the oil, which is a little bit harder on these cars. Uh, because again, we don't have the dipstick, but I can pull off the oil cap and I, you know, it sounds crazy, but I kind of give it a sniff and kind of look, make oh, sure yeah, it doesn't. Totally. Like, I sniff. No uh, I sniff. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now that we're on the inside here, the back wall has another carpet sound deadening piece that we've already pulled out. Um, a few 10 millimeters, you know, the 10 millimeter socket that you have to have to work on these cars. And this plate simply pulls out. And there you can see, let me get the light here. Now you can see all the pulleys, the belts. Uh, one thing I learned just this earlier today, I was over at our local independent shop, Benchmark Motors, and they were working on an 08 Cayman that had an oil leak, uh, which seemed to be kind of just behind the, the driver's seat and before the um, the uh, the driver's side rear wheel and what had happened is i don't know if you can see this and i think i took a picture um robert of the cam seal cap that is like right around there and apparently it's just a cap that finds itself loose and it, there's not pressured oil back there but it will start to leak so like like nathan said i'm just looking around to see if there's any visible leaks and 
Damon, your car's pretty clean, man. Thank you. Looks good. <laughs> Belts look good. Nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Yeah, one of the things, other thing I will point out about um, Boxsters and Caymans that as a guy with OCD, just, just have an awareness. One thing that makes them a little more challenging from a service standpoint is you definitely want to pick a service provider that's careful, uh, which is why I maybe don't want to go to someone who's less careful because to do all of this service, they're oftentimes sort of almost climbing physically into your car. <laughs> Right. If I can make a comment on that, uh, I actually replaced the belt uh, on this and the alternator, and it was not fun at all. It yeah. was super <laughs> tough. Uh, I had to use some deep creep and PB blaster to free up a little spot on the alternator and before I could finally get it out. Yeah, so you definitely want to take it to someone that's done it before. You don't want to be the guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's definitely DIY. Obviously, Damon did it at his house, and there's lots of resources on PCA.org and and on our YouTube channel that we can, um, you know, you can always use as a reference. All right, so we're just going to leave those panels there. I'll let Damon put it back together. Uh, turn off the light here. I think we do have our winners now. Uh, let me walk over there so I can see. So hopefully this format of me walking around and showing you a car, you guys are enjoying it. We'll do more of that if you like. So we have George Manning of Central Indiana region with a Nurburgring shirt. Uh, George, just send us a note, send Damon a note, uh, letting us know your size. And then Jose, congratulations from Mid-Ohio region. You've won the track print canvas paintings. All right, let me get back to my spot here. How are we doing on time? I saw a question posted up. Could we, could we answer that, Boop? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is there a way to install an oil temperature or pressure sensor in the 987-1? Well, the good news is, um, yes, there's a really, 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 really easy uh, way to do this. Um, Porsche actually already knows all this information. They just choose not to share it with you. So one of the best things you can get is get a Bluetooth OBD-1 dongle, which plugs into your OBD-2 port, and then you get an app. There's, there's several out there that you can use. And you can access a bazillion different parameters on your car, right down to throttle position, opening, true speed, actual engine coolant temp, oil temperature, oil pressure, um, all that. And you can monitor and log all that. So I'm kind of a nerd. I generally, if I go on a trip, I'll plug mine in. Um, just I like to watch a bunch of parameters that Porsche doesn't uh, give you. So that's the easiest way to do it. And then you don't have to make any mechanical changes to actually access that information. You just... Uh, pull it out of the car's computer, which already knows it. Hopefully that helps. So I see someone posted a question about how susceptible is the 08S to IMS bearing fair. I think we kind of already touched upon that, um, but I don't know if you want to say anything else about it, uh, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, and you can talk to people that are more experts, but I think it's generally understood to be less than 1%. It's not zero. But again, to me, it, it falls into the tolerable risk category. Because one of the things that we can also get is we can get so obsessed thinking about what could fail, uh, we, we forget that 99% of them are driving around that aren't failing, right? Um, or something else that's unrelated. It is a mechanical device. Things can fail. So your alternator can go bad or this can go bad. Um, so I personally, you know, I would subscribe to a lot of the information that's put out there by Mark experts related to appropriate engine uh, oil cho uh, choice, appropriate oil change schedule. And we can talk a little bit about that. I think this is going to be important. Um, how to use the car. Um, like when I'm going to pick a car, what I don't want to see is I don't want a car that has spent most of its life sitting around or most of its life in an urban environment where it's really low miles because the owner says, oh, it's really low miles because, uh, you know, I work at an office. It's a mile down the road. That's yeah. an absolute nightmare, worst case for one of these cars, because they never get up to temperature and you never burn off all mm -hmm. the moisture. Um, and that's where you get into situations with you know, bore scoring and failure. And people say, oh, the car only had 20,000 miles. I said, yeah, but it had, you know, 10,000 starts on it. The guy right. drove it to his mailbox, right? Um, so, and then same with the oil change interval. A lot of these cars tend to be low miles. Um, in fact, it was kind of funny. This actually wasn't a Porsche, but I, I won't call this car out, <clears throat> but it might have happened to have been an S54 powered BMW M Roadster on BAT the other day. And <laughs> I was chuckling because 
it was an original owner car and had very low miles and the car is now 20 years old and i think it had something like 8000 miles and it had only gotten one service in its entire life oh my goodness because well, in this person's mind well it's not due for miles well of yeah. course it's not due for miles but it's due for time so uh, whatever you do change the oil on these things annually that's Regardless whether you go 300 miles or 3,000 miles, change the oil. It's a cheap and easy insurance. So, yeah. We have a question from someone. They said, is it bad if it burns a lot of oil? I think in general, the answer is yes. But I think when you're looking at Porsches in terms of burning oil, you have to figure out why it's burning oil, right? Yeah. You know I mean, so as a general rule, these are not known to be burners when everything's right. So, you know, in the older generation of Porsche, if you read an owner's manual, if let's take a, you know, 911 SC, Porsche actually says they expected to burn one quart every 600, which of course they generally didn't. Um, but a typical one might have burned a quart every 1500. One of these, if everything's right, they almost burn an indiscernible amount of oil, right? If you get one that's burning oil, then my concern is bore scoring. That's mm -hmm. my number concern on one of these if it's burning oil. There's a couple other reasons they burn oil, but yeah, if I had one that was burning really anything more than a quart every, say, 1,500, uh, particularly if I was looking at it to buy, there's plenty of them on the market I would just pass. If I owned the car, then I would probably start doing some investigation of where that oil is going. Yeah, and if those of you missed our bore scoring Tech Tactics Live, check it out on the past videos and you'll learn a lot. Now, obviously, we won't have time to go through it uh, here tonight. Uh, let's move into, all right, I've looked at this car. When is it smart to walk away from the example? This car, I wouldn't walk away. I actually think it's, uh, it's, it's pretty nice, especially if he gives me a good deal for it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, the good thing to know is that um, these cars were sold in an era where Porsche was selling like hotcakes, the economy was good, and so they made a lot of these cars. So please don't get caught into thinking that you found the only one, the last one. So it, if you want to err on the side of caution, err on the thought that there is another car out there. So if you get a car, and even if I call it your spidey sense says, eh, something about this car, I can't quite put my finger on it, but it doesn't speak to me, just pass. Move on to the next one. There's going to be another car. Um, I mean, to me, the hard pass on these cars is... And I know not everyone agrees with me, but I'm a hard pass on any car with any kind of salvage title. Mm -hmm. um, again, in the market, they don't sell for enough discount to um, cover for the risk. And the other thing is I always tell people, you're not really saving money because the discount you pay for a salvage title car up front, you're going to take on the back end when you go to sell it. Mm -hmm. So you save money during that period of time, but you're not really ahead. So why take the risk? It's not the only car out there. So to me, I'm going to pass on a car that's got salvage title. I'm probably going to pass on a car that is a complete unknown. Um, again, there's too many good cars out there with history. So if I get a car and it pops up and I know absolutely nothing about it, um, unless it's so compelling and it passes a PPI with absolute flying colors, I just think, you know what, I'd rather have one where I know when it's been serviced because for example like oil change interval a car can pass a ppi and look good but i'll have no idea how it was used or what it's oil change interval so that's going to have some wear that i won't see until it's too late and so if i have the opportunity to buy one from say a club member and, and i've got a log of every time it's with service and it was serviced you know like literally to the t um, that's a better gamble than one where i think oh i save a couple bucks and i'm buying a total unknown it's yeah. just not worth so these unknown cars, like I can think of an example where like maybe a wholesale auction, some car flipper buys it and puts it on their front lot and they just basically have no paperwork. They have two keys, maybe even only one key and you go to look at it and they'll polish it up. They'll probably dress the engine. They'll take things apart and make it look good. But I, I'm, I'm with you. Like I, I really would like to, as you, you have always said, buy the owner, buy the the maintenance and, um, you know, because things can be polished up. I mean, um, yeah, definitely, definitely want to more. Anything else that would make you walk away from a car? Um, gosh. High I mean, mileage? I think I, um, 
I'm not opposed to mileage as long as the price is commiserate, except one of the things you got to remember, anytime you get to extreme, pricing behaves like a hockey curve, a hockey stick, right? So when you get extremely low mileage, people pay a massive premium for the crazy low mileage cars. Um, but then what happens as you get to really high mileage cars, they get to a point which I call the, the, the point where they just don't get any cheaper. So mm -hmm. take a Cayman as an example. In today's market, clean title manual transmission Cayman, there isn't one you can buy anywhere in the world probably for less than 15 grand, right? Well, you could probably find a $15,000 base that has – I don't know, 100,000 miles on it. Well, what's the one that's got 200,000 miles worth? Well, it's not worth half. It's it's still worth 15 because it's a it's a Cayman, right? So if I had those two comparators, well, I'd rather have the 100,000 mile one than the 200,000 mile one, right? Um, all other things being equal, you know, yeah. oftentimes there, there aren't, there would be something different, but yeah, nothing gets cheaper um, that way. So. But I'll, I'll go back to what you said earlier. There are a lot of these cars out there, and there are some tremendous values. And Damon, are you okay with me sharing how much you paid for this car? So this car has how many thousand miles when you bought it? Uh, so I bought it with 49,600. 49,000 miles when you bought it. It's an 07. And here's a plug for our very own PCA Mart. This car was listed on the Mart. Um, it was a local car to Maryland. And you bought this car for fourteen grand. Uh, fourteen seven. With, fourteen uh, seven, and that was what, like a year ago, maybe. Yeah, it was November two thousand nineteen. I bought it from a PCA member. Uh, he bought it new, and was getting a little bit older, and thought it was time to move on. So full records and everything. Um, so there are some really good deals out there still for these cars, and uh, maybe after this episode, the, the, <laughs> there'll be less. But you heard it here first. Um, some references that you might want to consider, uh, we talked, uh, I think we talked about the Boxster Register, uh, PCA's BoxterRegister.org and the CaymanRegister.org. The PCA folks to just live and breathe Boxster and Cayman stuff. We just, again, tonight we just touched the tip of the iceberg with you know, details and what to look for these cars. Um, the folks there are diehards and can help you out and you know, sign up and ask questions and I think there's even for sales and such that you can find a car in there. Um, another another resource for you is the PCA YouTube channel. Hey, real we, quick, Vu. Yeah. I need to pause for one second, so I'll be out of the picture for just a moment. Okay, go ahead. Um, technical DIY, DIY playlist on PCA's YouTube channel. Again, we have coverage on how to replace the cow. We have, you know, what to do for a pre-purchase inspection, um, the Cayman spars, if you want to switch from the round to, there's tons of stuff out there. So continue to look at that. And of course, submitting questions uh, through Pano or online to the PCA uh, Tech Committee. They are a great resource. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed it. I would like to say um, before we leave that, um, there, I don't know if you noticed here, but I did have a different Mark vehicle um, with me today. And um, I just wanted to close the show and, and recognize that the motorsport world lost an icon yesterday. And if you haven't heard, um, the queen of the Nürburgring, Sabine Schmidt, um, she's, she's racing up above right now. And uh, I thought we would end the show showing you all what she did best and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.